So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm here to talk about the Court of Justice and the discretion of the Court of Justice in copyright lawmaking. And this actually builds on my previous research, which was about the leeway of, of um, the EU legislator to legislate in the field of copyrights. And actually one of the examples was uh, given by the previous speakers on the, the directive on the term of extension and how the EU didn't really have powers for that. So building on that, I'm interested in, in, in assessing the powers of the Court of Justice and uh, specifically on proposing some speed bumps and speed humps. Now, for those of you who are not very familiar with the uh, road terminology, speed bumps are those uh, high and narrow bumps that are used to decrease velocity, to decrease speed of the cars. And speed humps are lower and larger and are aimed at improving security and traffic in general. Now, I, I'm going to quickly go through this. I hope I have time. Um, I'm going to talk about the driver's seat and the driver's license in this case and I'm going to briefly expound on the, the reasons of why we should care about this, this topic. Then I'm going to propose uh, speed bumps and speed humps and then I'm going to propose some recommendations on how to drive safely. Now regarding the driver's seat, the situation where the Court of Justice goes beyond its tasks, let's say the, co the situation where it acts as a copyright law or policy maker, are gener uh, generally termed judicial activism. The problem here is that there is no accepted definition in literature of judicial activism or, or of what that might be. There are several proposals and one of them is of Kmiek uh, from, from the US and Kmiak puts forth several examples of judicial activism of the courts. And one of them, for instance, is ignoring precedent. But of course we have some difficulties in transposing this to, to an EU framework because there is no system of binding precedent as such in the EU. I'll come back to that. But I think we can all agree um, that judicial activism basically comes down to the court going beyond the, the um, political agreement that is conveyed by legislation. Of course, the problem here is to see if a certain gap in legislation is there on purpose or whether it's an oversight of the legislator that should therefore be remedied by the court. Let me give you an example of, of what I think is uh, judicial activism in the context of the EU, or uh, how I like to call it, extended play. Now, in, info pack, in the InfoPAC decision, the Court of Justice has said that the criterion of originality as the author's own intellectual creation is applicable to every type of subject matter of, of copyright protected works, even though the EU legislator used it only for databases, software, and photographs. Um, now this, this uh, brings me to my next question. Does the driver have a license? In other words, can the court do this? Well, if we look at competence norms and what they say about the powers of the court, it's basically about the, valid the, the powers to interpret the validity of EU acts, of, of the acts of other EU institutions, and interpretation of the treaties. Now we can go to this article and it can be argued that this article could give more flesh to the mandate of, of the court. This is the Article 19 of the Treaty on the European Union, by the way, for those of you who are not lawyers, who I uh, assume it's the great majority. Um, and the problem with this article, though, in my view, is that it's a catch-22. It's actually up to the court to decide what the law means. So this begs the question, is there an open mandate of the court when it comes to the substance of its decisions? Or at least one that it's not often challenged by other EU institutions, and namely the lawmaker. And this actually prompted me to ask another question. If they don't bother where they are, are, are the institutions here, then why should we? Well, in my view, there are several reasons. So first is competence issues. If there is a gap in EU legislation, it might be that that gap is there 
because the competence for a specific subject matter lies in the member states, for example. But it can also be that um, the competence being competence of the EU, um, there's a question of division of powers. And this brings me to my second point, legitimacy. The fact uh, that the competence is of the EU doesn't empower the Court of Justice to just make laws. And of course, there's a question of legal certainty and of the quality of the acquis. And acquis is a legal term for what is out there in EU copyright law, what is acquired and what should therefore be respected. And br this brings me to my first speed bump that might reduce, let's say, the normative speed of uh, the Court of Justice. And this is the principle of constitutional legality. What does this mean? Well, the, this principle basically means that the acts of the institution should be in accordance with higher sources of law. And of course, this is a principle which is more geared towards the EU legislator, but it's also applicable to the Court of Justice because the Court of Justice should also be constitutionally constrained. And here, uh, in, in practice, this means that the court should take into account, for example, the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the balance between the different rights that is there. It should also take into account the different copyright traditions of the member states and, and cultural diversity. And this can cast a doubt on decisions such as Infopac um, that I mentioned earlier. When it comes to speed humps and how to improve security, let's say, and, and to improve the quality of the copyright acquis, well, on the one hand, the case law is part of that acquis, meaning part of, its of what it's acquired and part of what should be respected. But we should also uh, reflect upon the normativity of precedence and notice the air quotes here. The, the precedence of the EU might or might not have a different binding force on several actors. And here I would like to focus on three actors. So the first is national courts. And here, uh, very simply, the Court of Justice said that uh, the relationship of it with national courts is one of cooperation and not of supremacy. But the court has also said that in the context of a preliminary ruling, the national court that refers the question is bound by the ruling of the court in that case, which does not mean that the national court always follows the, the, the court of justice rulings because this has happened. When it comes to non-referring courts, so the, all the other courts on, on the European Union, the case Brasserie du Pêcheur basically has extended the binding force of the rulings of the court to all national courts of the EU. But again, this does not mean that these this, uh, rulings are always followed. And here, uh, basically, what I think we should bear in mind is that the court should base its rulings not on supremacy, but on coherence, and coherence of not only the EU, uh, EU legal order, but also the national orders of the member states. Um, what about the, the EU legislator? Well, actually, we have three directives, rental and lending, term of protection, satellite and cable, that are based on previous court's decisions. But this does not mean that the Commission is always, uh, the European Commission is always a blind follower. And one prime example of that is the public consultation of 2014. And there the, the Commission, while acknowledging that the court has a particular stance on the right of making available, which in this case is the targeting of the public as a criterion, the Commission actually, um, the Commission actually states uh, or asks whether the scope of the, the right is clear and even seems to suggest that the country of origin approach might be the way to go. So um, this leads me to my next point. What's the relationship between the, the negative integration, which is the action of the court, and positive integration? which is the action of the, the legislator. Well, it's not regulated, actually. And this leads us to ask, is there enough leeway for the EU legislator to not always follow the decisions of the court? Probably. I'm running out of time. 
um, just just uh, regarding the Court of Justice, and very quickly, there is no system of binding precedent of uh, the European Union in in the European Union, but the court tries to be consistent with its previous decisions through self-citation and selective referencing of previous cases. There are actually very few cases of reversal um, in in the Court of Justice, and this unfortunately might lead to path dependency. So a policy lock-in and a reinforcement of future policy choices based on previous decisions of the court that might be, well, bad. Um, and to come back to my uh, recommendations, well, first I would suggest that attention should be paid to the political agreement underlying a legislation. And this would mean, for example, for the court, um, that the court should use not only a, a teleological method of interpretation, which is actually the preferred one, but also look at the uh, systematic interpretation, meaning the context in which that leg legislation came about so we don't have decisions like InfoPAC. Um, and then using distinguishing and departing, uh, departing techniques. And distinguishing meaning uh, there are situations that the court can argue they are not the same, or at least they are not sufficiently similar for the court to apply previous decisions, and the parting simply getting rid of precedent uh, altogether because it's, well, let's face it, bad decisions and bad law. Thank you very much. <laughs>